Great. Uh, welcome, everybody, to this session on information disorder. My name is Rasmus Nielsen. I'm director of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at the University of Oxford, and I've been asked to moderate this session and to kick it off with a few uh, initial observations before we turn to the real substance of the session, which is the short presentations by my fellow panelists, and then, of course, the discussion that we hope will ensue with all of you uh, engaging uh, with your input on how we collectively can address problems of information disorder in different contexts around the world. So I was asked just to provide a little bit of initial input as a, um, an academic that's committed to connecting practice and research from the work that we do at the Reuters Institute and, and the work done by other researchers and academics around the world on what we know at this stage about problems of information disorder from independent evidence-based research, um, just to feed into the discussion of what we might do about the different kinds of problems that we face around the world. So I think the first thing I'll say is that the starting point here really in many ways is still the report that was supported by the Council of Europe and published last year by Claire Wardle and Hassan uh, Derek Shan with the title Information Disorder Itself, which makes a number of think of, of observations that are as important today as they were when they were made first last year by Claire and Hussein, in terms of how we think about problems of information pollution as they term it, which I think is a really powerful analogy in that it reminds us that the problems of information disorder we face are essentially about, like pollution, um, the interplay between us what we want as human beings, all the many different things we want, and technology, the ways in which technology empowers us to do it. And that information disorder, like pollution, in many ways is a um, often unintended, though sometimes calculated, byproduct um, of the ways in which we use technologies that we also use for entirely legitimate and un understandable purposes. And as with pollution, uh, I suppose we can also take from the analogy that Claire and Hassan offers us that it's dangerous to think um, in terms of sort of um, be and an end all solutions. Uh, information disorder like problems of pollution is probably not a, a problem that will go away, but a set of problems that we have to manage and find ways of minimizing to ensure that we can realize the full positive potential, both of each other but also of technology, while minimizing the harm that is generated in the process. I think there was also another really important uh, observation made in the information disorder report uh, from Claire and Hussein last year that I think is worth um, reiterating in a context like this, which is that they warned very strongly against using the term fake news. Um, and if I can al allow myself a little bit of editorializing here, I have to say I find it a little disappointing that that term is so central to how this issue is phrased by the Internet Governance Forum itself uh, and many of the entities involved here. Why is that? That's not just a question of sort of theological disputes over con concepts or terminology. This is a really important, substantially important point that is worth reiterating here. The term fake news is first dangerous. It's dangerous because it's demonstrably instrumentalized by politicians and others who want to undercut the credibility of independent news media trying to hold them to account. Uh, this is uh, demonstrated not only by, on a daily basis by many prominent politicians, including some who live in rather prominent White Houses, um, but also by independent research that assess the consequences of such political discourse, which we see in many countries around the world, and demonstrates uh, that this undermines credibility in independent information providers. So the term is dangerous. <coughs> it's also misleading. It's misleading because much of what we discuss when we discuss problems of information disorder are neither fake nor news, which makes the term fake news a rather inadequate uh, at describing the nature of the problem. It's not fake in the sense that it can be factually accurate information that is released with malicious intent. Um, there has been uh, instances of that in several uh, countries with strategic leaks of information that in itself is factually accurate, but it was partial information, it was uh, released with strategic timing to influence elections, for example, and in other ways um, uh, undermine democratic or political processes. Um, and furthermore, much of it is not news at all. 
and that is the amplification of polarizing political discourse, for example, have nothing to do with news. So the term fake news, I think, is dangerous and misleading, and this is a point that Claren Hussein made more than a year ago, uh, and I'm very glad to see that both the European Commission and, for example, the British government has explicitly distanced themselves from the use of this term, and I hope many others will follow that. Um, and again, this is backed by research. This is a, a term that undermines people's confidence. Um, just a few other things, and I will tweet some links if people are interested in the underlying research uh, once the session is over, but just a few other um, remarks from me, and then we should hear from our panelists. Um, it's clear from independent research, obviously, that we have real problems with information disorders. Uh, we know that these are enabled by some of the same technologies that we also use for legitimate purposes, mm -hmm. so the question really is how we can contain the unintended consequences while realizing the full positive consequences. Me Too is powered by the same dy dynamics as many disinformation campaigns, and the question, I suppose, is how we can have one without the other, or power, empower one without empowering the others. We also know that the actors and contexts that influence how disinformation plays out are very, very different around the world. The actors include foreign governments, domestic politicians, commercial actors, as well as us as citizens sometimes, what we might think of as bottom-up disinformation, where we, often in good faith, or sometimes with ideological, political, or other convictions, are spreading information that could be harmful. So context matters, actors matter, and I think in terms of the research, I will just say that um, most of the empirical evidence-based independent research we have seen, unfortunately, is almost exclusively focused on the highly unusual in a global perspective context of the United States. And I think we can learn much from that research, but we should be very careful before we assume that things that are found in the U.S. are necessarily applies elsewhere. But with that in mind, just a few top-line observations before we turn uh, to the panelists of what we have found from research in the United States. First, and I think this is an important um, part of the uh, discussion, um, some of the best empirical research, including work by Andy Guest, Princeton, for example, suggests that in the United States, where this debate became very uh, prominent after the 2016 election and influenced arguably global discourse around this problem, um, researchers estimate that 25% of Americans were exposed to demonstrably false and fabricated information in the run-up to the 2016 election. 25%. That means 75% were not. Uh, 25% is a big number, but it might be a lower number than the one many of us uh, have in mind. So I think there is a question sometimes about whether we have an accurate evidence-based grasp of the scale and scope of problems with disinformation, and the U.S. research suggests that sometimes the problem is of somewhat different contours than is assumed uh, in some discussions. Secondly, uh, we know that the, from multiple studies that the reach of demonstrably false and fabricated information on the web is often more limited than we might assume, but it's also very important to recognize that on social media, some disinformation providers have far greater reach than they have on the open web. So there are very specific problems that are arguably particularly pertinent when it comes to social media platforms and increasingly messaging applications. We can put in a parenthesis here the question of television and whether some TV providers are part of the problem, but that might be one for the discussion. Finally, um, it's clear that the social context matters here. It's about actors and about technologies, but it's also about the context in which people seek out and use information. And in the United States, like in many other countries around the world, the context here, of course, is one of low trust in institutions, high levels of political polarization, um, and a large part of the population who've turned their backs against uh, established media. And indeed, when we, in audience research, ask people to define what the term fake news means for them, sadly and unfortunately, uh, very often the problem that people offer is poor journalism. Uh, now, I don't personally believe that poor journalism at the, is, at the, is at the central driving force uh, of information disorder as we see it today, but the fact that much of the public thinks so is in itself important, and I think it's hopefully an important part of the conversation today, what we can do to ensure that independent journalism is A, sustainable, B, trusted when it is trustworthy, and C, an effective uh, part of the institutional setup that provides checks and balances of problems of information disorder. So with that uh, kickoff, I think we have an uh, outstanding panel to discuss uh, what different actors are trying to do about addressing these issues. Uh, we have first uh, Tanya Smokwina, who will talk uh, first amongst the panelists, and we'll turn to Giacomo Mazzone and Olaf Stenbart after that. So Tanya, over to you. was asked to give you some information on the national approaches, but also to present the work the Council of Europe is uh, doing in, the, in this sphere. Um, as 
a matter of fact, as you uh, correctly uh, described, this is a very complex and uh, multidimensional problem. And it's, it cannot be addressed by very simple uh, one-dimensional solutions. And maybe, sorry? And um, also we can see that the states are not um, doing at the moment uh, a lot of concrete uh, activities. So they uh, act mostly as a kind of um, enablers and facilitators of discussions. Uh, many established uh, specific task forces and there is not much work done on this institutional, administrative, or legislative uh, level. Uh, in the international fora, as you already said, uh, we have this great document uh, for those uh, who, who haven't seen it yet. It's a great resource and uh, also providing a lot of uh, tangible um, opportunities, tangible uh, steps that can be implemented uh, in, in our uh, practices. And um, what is the main problem with the information disorder is that it doesn't only undermine uh, the trust in democratic institutions uh, like media, but also uh, in terms of this overall pollution also uh, creates uh, a good grounds uh, for different conspiracy theories which affect or give rise uh, to, to um, lowering of our trust in evidence and uh, in the long run uh, creates disengagement and also sharpen the divisions in the society. Um, but when we come uh, to this regulatory level, um, it is always a problem uh, to tackle uh, the issues related to speech with uh, classical regulatory measures. We always have this fear uh, that this can turn uh, into a censorship ma machine. And also on the other hand, if we require uh, that uh, the um, digital platforms, digital intermediaries take more responsibility and do uh, a lot of work uh, on their own, they also can, it also can be tricky. They also can turn into private censorship uh, machine. Machine. So th there has to be uh, some balance achieved and I believe that there is quite some room uh, for uh, collaboration in, 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 in this uh, sphere. Um, still, they are the new gatekeepers. So we already have an established set of mechanisms for addressing the old gatekeepers. So we are now about to find the new ways and balanced, proportionate ways to address these new gatekeepers. Um, this was recognized also by the Council of Europe um, in the document, um, actually recommendations of the Council of Ministers on the roles and responsibilities of digital intermediaries. Uh, the document was uh, adopted this year in March 2018. Uh, and I think it's quite um, um, a landmark, a pioneering document because it is very clearly um, outlining the role and also addressing the respons responsibilities not only of the states but the intermediaries as well. And also important in stressing that all the information coming from this governmental side has to be prescri prescribed by law and mustn't be excessive and uh, clearly nece necessary and proportionate if we, we, we can uh, deem it as a kind of democratic measure. Uh, in the European Union, we just, uh, last week, uh, it was adopted the AVMS directive, which is also an important document to have to highlight here. Uh, many see it as a good uh, progress uh, and others fear that it will again give some grounds for private companies, big techs turning into uh, private regulators. I think there is still a lot of questions about how this document will be implemented in the daily work of the regulatory authorities. Of one, on one hand, for sure, it will 
course, some action on the side of uh, the corporations, but it also gives the room to form new co-regulatory regime, regimes, participatory regimes, which can be, uh, in a way, uh, a good solution for, for these complex prob problems. Uh, we, we have to also um, bear in mind that there is a range of responses uh, possible, not only uh, self-regulatory or regulatory. We also have uh, lots of great work uh, being done by the civil society organizations and NGOs, and this has to be further, uh, further supported. And also, you mentioned the ro uh, role of academia. Uh, I, I think that there shall be no regulation without an adequate research, yeah? without an adequate uh, evidence, and also the analysis of possible implications and impact of different interventions. Um, and also, since there already is a lot of understanding of communication processes, but as you, as you said, there is a kind of lack of very targeted research. Uh, specifically, um, I think there is a lack of research into offline effects of online uh, communication. Um, and um, also, uh, it should be highlighted and um, bared in mind here that sometimes we neglect different forms of communication. We, we mostly, when we discuss this thing, things focused on news and facts. We are concerned, uh, concerned with truth and reality, but there is more than that in our communication. It's also uh, the transfer of beliefs, of emotions, of different uh, narratives. And um, this is, I think, also something that has to be taken into account here. So, um, uh, I was involved recently in a project, a pilot project on the EU level, uh, taking into consideration just 11 uh, member states at the moment, but it will be broadened very soon to the, the remaining um, uh, European countries. And it was uh, interesting that we found out we um, examined the existing initiatives uh, both re uh, of regulatory type and self-regulatory media literacy, raising awareness type. And uh, we found out that in these 11 countries, uh, most of these initiatives are one stakeholder initiatives. Despite these problems being so multidimensional and so transborder. So most of these existing uh, initiatives are so far limited on uh, a nation state level. And I think this, uh, maybe we can discuss how to broaden the scope of these initi uh, initiatives and find uh, a good way of collaboration here. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you very much, Tanya. I think that's definitely a point we should return to when we open up the discussion. But uh, first, perhaps, Giacomo, you could tell us something about what the European Broadcasting Union and your members are, are doing to address these issues. Yes, <clears throat> the European Broadcasting Union, as you know, is the association that gathers all the public service broadcasters of Europe, plus also some commercial broadcasters. Um, for us, the, this debate has been always a little bit slippery because uh, for us, uh, fake news uh, and tackle the fake news uh, simply acting of making good journalism. So it's very difficult to define this dimension, but of course, we realize that this dimension exists in itself and there's a set of problems that cannot be solved simply making good journalism. Um, so we have, um, over the years, we have tried to define a certain number of initiatives that uh, could work uh, better in order to tackle this problem. Um, one of the the, uh, one of the most effective that we have done is called the Eurovision Newswire, uh, social newswire, that um, is the equivalent of what we run since 50 years, that are the exchange of news. Uh, we have added to the exchange of traditional TV news, we have uh, added um, uh, this exchange that is cooperative based, again, 
uh, there's a fact-checking of user-generated contents. More and more, the news that we have to hire on uh, broadcasting uh, are um, based on uh, material that can be found only on the internet and that are not provided by traditional uh, media actors, not news agencies, not other broadcasters. So the reliability of this is very, very disputable. And it's important for all the newsroom in Europe and in the world to be sure that this, this material is important because the, the moment that the news, fake news, uh, exists into the internet world and is bring into the media world, the traditional media world, this has a disruptive effect because not only consolidate a fake news in the, be, in the belief of the listeners, readers, etc., etc., but also decredibilize ones that is discovered that is not true, they decredibilize the, media, the traditional media. So for us, it's very, very dangerous, and it is important to, to tackle it properly. So we have created, um, on a collaborative base, uh, a network of 450 journalists um, after less than one year of uh, exercise in 28 countries, not only in Europe, but also in other uh, countries where the media system is well developed, like uh, US and Japan. Um, and what they do is that once as they find something on the web that is um, interesting, then, but they are not sure about the sources, they provide to the network and they ask everybody that could make um, some work on that, some research, some uh, verification to share this information. And then at the end of the assessment, that has to be done as unfortunately, as you know, in very short span of time, this news, if validated, could, could be used in traditional media. This is uh, a very effective um, answer. Of course, uh, you cannot tackle all the issues of the world. You cannot only tackle the ones that uh, are Im uh, immediately at your site. Um, the problem there, again, is, and we have seen this during the election campaign, where the, the um, immediately reaction uh, is fundamental. Uh, we have seen that this kind of work cannot be done properly without uh, a full um, cooperation of the social network. Because w you, you don't know when you look at the news uh, if this is the one that is flying and that is going very fast across the, the social media users, unless that the, the platform cooperate with you. And, and then, even if you, once that you, you have been told, as it happened, for instance, in France, when we did the cooperative effort with uh, some platforms to work on that. Even if you know which one, which one is the news that is um, to be verified and you discover that it's fake, then the platform need to do something to, to avoid that this could spread around. Because of course the most incredible news are the ones that are uh, the one that spread uh, the faster. If you, I say that the donk fly, uh, I will read this news. If you say that the donk is walking on the street, this is not a news. So, we need to, the only way to work is if it can done, this work can be done together. Um, the, the success of this experience of the Eurovision Social Newswire is bring to another thing that is that some of these tools are open tools. Uh, when you want to verify the, uh, the exact date of a picture, when you want to verify uh, the so sources behind it, when you want to verify uh, the location, some tools that are open, uh, open source can be usually um, uh, adapted for this kind of um, verification. And uh, so we are putting online for this community of uh, journalists that participate to the network a certain number of tools with a certain number of uh, tutorials that could help people to do this, their job at home. Because of course the Eurovision social um, media newswire is for news that have a relevance beyond the country, uh, a news that could be of interest to be spread and shared uh, around Europe. But if it's a news only of the country, the interest of the others to verify if something is fake uh, in Italy that, that belongs only to the Italians, there is not a lot of interest. So it's important to empower the journalists in the newsroom, and you know that there is a gap of generation um, because the, the old gen generation of journalists like myself are not used to, to use this kind of skills and, and tools. Um, so this, more and more, this tutorial are provided and are quite successful. Then EBU participate, has launched um, uh, itself uh, internally a quality journalism initiative that means that uh, 
we have uh, <coughs> we have provided a, a report because research is the basic for understanding and this report is called uh, um, uh, the perfect storm uh, is a very interesting reading if you have the time and it's online and available for everybody um, the perfect storm, with this term we indicate the, the fact that there are many factors that, as, uh, as Rasmus mentioned before, that are happening together. The, there is the weakening of the traditional media, there is the rise of new media and the people that uh, only get information through the, the social media, for instance. There is also the um, pauperization of the journalistic profession. Because when you say poor journalism, true, but if a journalist is paid eight euros for a news and has to produce uh, 20 news a day, what kind of quality you can expect? So there is a problem basically in, in the quality of journalism. This doesn't affect mainly the public broadcast because we have usually journalists under regular contract, but all the rest of the profession is now really affected by this pauperization that uh, of course has consequences on on the quality of the journey. So for us, the quality of journalism is essential, um, and uh, we are doing seminars in all the countries, with, uh, in the newsroom, with the journalists, with the manager of journalists, because most of the time the work is to be done together with the management, uh, and with the IT part, because more and more there are skills that are not usually in the profession that are needed, absolutely needed, if you want to be effective in this world. Um, this we do internally, as I said, with this seminar for all our 72 members around Europe uh, and the Mediterranean borders, but also we do um, participating to other activities. This is why we co-organize with the Council of Europe the seminar today, because, uh, for instance, we participate um, to the uh, working group on the algorithms. Uh, many of the <laughs> us today are involved in that. And there is a second working group on uh, uh, quality journalism, so we are proud to be part of these efforts. But also we have been part, we, we participate to all the efforts that are going in this direction. For instance, our director general has participated to the high-level panel expert group of the, of the European Commission. But I don't know if you are aware, at the end of the day, uh, most of the profession uh, what is, that are gathered in the sounding boards they distanciate themselves from the final conclusion of the working group. Because uh, the, uh, as you probably are aware, uh, some weeks ago, the final outcome of the, this expert group was a, a certain number of self-regulation by some social media platforms that they have to accomplish and there will be hopefully a verification of the effectiveness of their engagement and the respect of this engagement. But unfortunately, what we, this is why we took distance from this conclusion, is that there is no measurable um, tool for understanding if this self-verification and uh, self-regulation has been effective. Uh, the social media remain the only one that can assess what they've done, and uh, they are not even obliged to disclose their tools. And this is the work that we are doing, for instance, in the, uh, um, in the algorithm working group. Uh, it's impossible that so important decision for citizenship, uh, let's imagine the about the elections, are taken based on algorithms that you are not even uh, aware what there is in, on, on which principle they work. Just to close, then, two other important things that we are doing. This efforts for uh, the uh, information disorder and quality journalism cannot be divided and split from another thing that is absolutely crucial, the safety of journalists. Because the, the fake news has a, are a way to kill quality journalism, but the other one, the, there is a most effective way that is to kill, to kill the journalist. Then there is no need to, for fake news. You kill the journalist and and in some cases, most of the information, most of the investigative journalism has, been, has gone. So you cannot split the two jobs. These are two parts of the same activity. You cannot forget the one and doing the other. And the final point is that uh, we participate to a very interesting initiative that uh, uh, is the um, uh, Journalist Trust, Trust Initiative. But I leave the floor to somebody else that can take uh, better this point. 
Thank you very much, <coughs> Giacomo. So, Olaf, this is a perfect tee-up for you to talk about the Reports Without Borders, your broad work, but also specifically the Journalism Trust indicators. Yes, thank you very much to EBU and the Council of Europe for having us. Um, and maybe to kick this off and to surprise you a little, um, as a human rights NGO and campaigner, I will talk a lot about money. Um, and as you see, I have adjusted my outfit um, accordingly. Um, Reporters Without Borders is mainly a human rights NGO. We defend the um, freedom of information, the freedom of the press and the media. Um, but in doing so, um, we have, I think, lately discovered uh, the importance of the economic angle of things, also including this debate around online disinformation, for two main reasons. One is we are more and more deeply understanding that in order to sustain independent journalism, you need a healthy media landscape. Or to turn this around, if the media landscape is not healthy and functioning, also in, in economic terms and sustainable, it's almost impossible to sustain independent journalism. The second reason is that we are observing, I think not very scientifically, but as human beings, that the behavior of humans and also the behavior of companies um, is mainly driven by benefits and incentives. Maybe also by values, hopefully, but not only but also by money, to put, it, to put it straight. So let's follow the money. This was our kind of initial um, idea behind um, our, our initiative. And as you know, probably most of you know Reporters Without Borders by our flagship um, publication, which happens to be the World Press Freedom Index, which we publish every year in May, which mainly um, assesses and computes and analyzes, let's say, the traditional threats against journalists, which are mainly physical and legal. So journalists are being hurt, killed, jailed. And to be honest, this is usually very easy to pinpoint because it's pretty much black and white. You usually have an enemy. You have somebody to denounce. However, and this then relates to this economic angle, there seem to be new threats in addition to this, technological, economic threats to journalism and journalists. We call them invisible prisons. And the problem here is that this is not so easy to um, pinpoint or analyze. You don't have a, a clear villain to denounce. It's a pretty messy, I would say, and confusing environment. And in trying to disentangle this, um, we asked ourselves, what are the main instruments or criteria which define the production and distribution of information these days? And I think we were ending up with two main spheres, let's say. One is a very traditional one, codes of ethics and practice of our profession, which frankly, is not rocket science to come down with a list of elements what good journalism is. Um, it goes back to the Munich Charter and you have all these ethical codes, uh, I think there are 400 plus of them, which are pretty much identical and telling you what uh, the, the professional norms of journalism are. And then these days you have algorithms which are mainly guiding the distribution of content, also journalistic content. And our main understanding is that these two fears are totally disconnected. They don't communicate. The ethical norms, and I'm not talking so much about compliance, whether or not they are being observed and uphold, but just the creation and the guarding of these ethical professional norms in journalism are mainly driven by journalists which is a self-regulatory principle. While the algorithmic distribution of journalism is mainly drawn up, defined, guarded, and run by tech people in the Silicon Valley. And our main um, objective, let's say, with the Journalism Trust Initiative is to connect these two, two spheres, to translate professional norms of journalism of journalism into algorithmic distribution of journalism. 
which might sound a little technical, but this is how we understand self-regulation in the 21st century. We believe that it should be journalists and not techies to define the criteria for algorithmic distribution of content. And how are we going to do this? Uh, we picked a very ancient instrument, which is um, standard setting. So you can think of ISO, uh, which probably everybody knows from car safety and door handles. But it also um, reaches out to services quite a bit. So we applied and launched a standardization process under the guidelines of SEN, which is the European subset of ISO, so the European Committee of Standardization, to develop and implement trust indicators for journalism, for mainly not only human but also algorithmic um, decision making. And this brings me back to the economic angle. Because if you ask yourself, what is the business model of the platforms, it's mainly selling advertising, right? And we believe that in this trust equation, it's not only about consumer citizens on the one hand and media outlets, but it's also to a large extent about advertisers as well, which we believe need to be included not only in this equation in a the theoretical sense, but also in terms of um, projects, regulation, whatever um, solution we might seek in this, in this debate all around, or all around uh, online disinformation. And interestingly, if you talk to advertisers, they are facing the same problems. I mean, of course, there are also outliers in the advertising business that just go for reach no matter what. But the majority, we understand, is trying to protect their brand reputation, which is quite hard online when you find your latest Mercedes or chocolate bar next to child porn or IS recruitment or um, um, hate speech. So they have a vested interest in, um, in these trust indicators as well. And this is the main logic we try to establish. If we can align ad spending with the compliance to ethical professional norms in journalism, it can automatically help to remonetize journalism. So this is more or less what we, what we try to establish. We have, as I said, launched this process with a number of around 70 stakeholders under the guidelines of the European Committee for Standardization. And the final outcome, the standard, including, of course, a public consultation, is bound to come out in about a year from now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olaf. I think we ended on a perfect note there from Tanya's observation about the limitations of one stakeholder responses to, I think, a very eloquent call for a response that builds on the interest of the public, uh, but involves not only public authorities, also advertisers, technology companies, and uh, journalists slash news media itself. We should open it up now for questions um, or comments from the floor. Uh, when you raise your hand, please use the mic and identify yourself and I direct your comment or question at one of the panelists. Uh, so. yeah, hello, uh, my name is Xavier Brandao. Uh, I'm working on a small project, uh, a counter speech project. So um, it's, a, it's a kind of website, uh, a database of misconceptions and prejudices that can be found uh, on the internet on various subjects and to me I think the civil society must uh, also have a role to, to play uh, and, and be present online and, and also uh, act as a vector of counter speech to, to prejudices. Uh, so I wanted to know what, what is being done uh, to support, uh, I, I wanted to ask the Council of Europe, what is, what is being done uh, for civil society to su support civil society organizations? Um, and especially I think it's not only regulation or supporting journalism, but it's also uh, proactively uh, going online and occupying the, the, the space. Thank you. I cannot really speak in, on behalf of the Council of Europe, so I will ask for help uh, a colleague sitting in the audience who is representing the Council of Europe. Uh, 
I'm a member of uh, a committee dealing with uh, artificial intelligence, uh, addressing the possible implications of, of algorithms. So, but um, this uh, issue is being highlighted quite a few times uh, by the Council of Europe as well. But I would really like, if possible, Elena, can you can you answer this question? Okay. Yes, sure. Thank you. I will take this, this question. Well, I have to say that the Council of Europe is actually now working as a hub for all sorts of initiatives from all sorts of stakeholders. What we're doing, we're trying to connect uh, business, civil societies, governments and put them at one table to discuss and uh, develop certain synergies. The report that was mentioned today, the information disorder report, in the end suggests a vast number of conclusions which in particular show how different types of stakeholders can work together. It even has proposals for some specific synergies where civil society could work with the media and where civil society could work with the governments. So I really invite you to find the report. It's available online free of charge and actually there you will find a list of conclusions. Thank you. Hi, uh, Julie Pizzetti from the Reuters Institute um, alongside Rasmus. Um, my question is probably to all of you, so um, you can decide who wants to, to take it. But it, it goes to your point, the colleague from the EBU, really, which is that it's not just a question of dealing with trust and credibility on the side of quality journalism um, or disinformation in isolation. There's also this question of journalism safety. I'm wondering if you could talk to the intersection of these themes. So we have a situation now where there's um, mounting evidence of state-sponsored disinformation campaigns targeting journalists and journalism with a view to either through harassment or shutdowns or um, doxing or other um, threats. Um, seeking to, to actually weaponize disinformation as a means of attacking um, and undermining journalism. So I'm interested to know how you think we could tackle that intersecting threat. All of this, I think, is straight within your purview. <laughs> might sound a little boring, but I cannot just, uh, just repeat myself. It's the economy, stupid. We find in many, many places that, for example, if you take Mexico, which is the, I think, most dangerous place on earth for journalists apart from Syria, that um, the safety of journalists there and killings have an economic dimension because it's not the um, well-paid, fully employed network correspondent from the capital, but usually the precarious um, freelance person, local reporter who puts him or herself in harm's way. So there you have an media economy which is thriving, which is growing four times faster than the Mexican economy. So it can afford, you know, sensible and safe journalism and exactly the op opposite happens. So um, this, I think, tells us that it really has a lot to do with, with the sustainability of our profession. And let's not be mistaken, I think at a large scale, journalism as a business is failing. And whenever markets are failing, usually I also believe it's, it's an antitrust issue, which um, again, I mean, we all, I think, remember the, um, which was mentioned already, the EU high level group. The, the, I think, largest and most powerful weapon of the European Commission, competition right, which as a weapon, as an instrument, was taken off the table from day one of this high-level group, quite surprisingly to me, I must say. And we believe really that it's, it is a question of f failing markets and competition as well. Um, I, I think that um, can, a lot of things can be done. Um, and the first is, uh, again, uh, looking for spreading the information. For instance, I would be delighted if we can, uh, if Yuri Lansipura that is here in the room can tell us a word because there has been a case that has been neglected by the public opinion in, in Europe, but it's the first case of a sentence of a court against trolls attacking journalists for intimidating in their investigative journalism and uh, where the attack 
that started in the virtual world then arrive into the real world. I don't know if, can I ask Julio to tell, to share with us? Yeah, <coughs> good morning. Uh, Uriel Anzipura from Isaac, Finland. Uh, just briefly, there was a case, as Giacomo said, where, uh, they, where there was a, a court case where a journalist of the Finnish Broadcasting Union, uh, Finnish Broadcasting uh, Company uh, Corporation, uh, had been subjected to a long time persecution by uh, trolls, uh, wouldn't name them or their provenance, but, uh, but anyway, uh, a couple of them are Finns, and they were one was uh, one was fi finally uh, convicted of of the of this persecution, uh, and uh, one was convicted to a firm prison term of one and a half years. The other was given uh, a sort of conditional term one year. So I think that that's a, that's a good beginning that the courts are going to take, are going to, are beginning to take these cases seriously. Thank you. So there's a question here. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Maxim Brykiewicz is my name, and Deputy Director of the Press Information Department of the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I have actually a couple of questions to uh, you panelists. The first one would be the following. Uh, well, er, I might perfectly understand perfectly well why there is this motivation uh, to sort of move away from the fake news notion towards somewhat more probably uh, broad and more generalist notion, which is not as discredited in some sort of mutual confrontation information campaigns as fake news is now. And uh, we basically do support this initiative to try to uh, uh, sort of reach some sort of international understanding and expert level of what this information might be. You can call it information disorder, but until there is an international consensus on what basically information disorder, or you can call it whatever you want, might be, uh, the explanation of malinformation, misinformation, disinformation, the way you put it in your uh, in, um, uh, book uh, might not be met uh, favorably from all the sides of, uh, I'd say, uh, Council of Europe space. So my question is, uh, would basically you support uh, some sort of intergovernmental initiative to come up with uh, intergovernmental negotiations or probably expert talks uh, in uh, order to try to reach a general, be it Council of Europe consensus or probably OSCE consensus or in broader term UN consensus on what this information disorder may be until once again you have this internationally uh, supported consensus in broader sense. I doubt that uh, uh, current information disorder notion might be implemented within the Council of Europe space as somewhat uh, universally uh, agreed. Uh, thing. That's uh, one thing. And by the way, uh, we have actually many times uh, come up with uh, this sort of initiative, be it uh, within the information uh, committee of the UN, uh, UN organization or at the EC level uh, to launch some sort of internal governmental talks uh, on this matter. But unfortunately, uh, these uh, proposals so far have not been met with uh, a due degree of enthusiasm, I would say. So once again, my question is whether or not you would support uh, some sort of initiative to gather together governmental experts to try you guys to reach out some sort of uh, compromise, universally acceptable notion of, of, on, of what disinformation might be now. And the second question is about this trust initiative issue. Uh, I do believe that probably there is a couple of Russian media outlets participating in this initiative now, and uh, I also know that uh, there have been quite a couple uh, of consultations already within this group. Uh, it's also a very good thing to probably communicate trust, uh, uh, journalist trust indicators uh, into what uh, industry really is. I mean, uh, to offer some sort of recommendations uh, to those who are forming uh, internet spies now, meaning uh, internet operators like Google, uh, I don't know, any other huge players in the field. But my concern is that once you communicate your 
understanding on what media can be trusted and what media cannot, the criteria uh, upon which you would determine this issue might be somewhat fluid or probably politically engaged. So could you please dispel my fears on that? I mean, what the criteria would be, which you would probably imply in order to reach that goal? Thank you very much. I think there were a lot of points there that the Council of Europe is noting down to take forward there. I think Olaf had a quick response on one of the points, and then we'll take a last question. Well, thank you. First of all, I mean, I'm not speaking for the Council of Europe, but to my knowledge, a lot of these things you are asking for uh, are existing already. I mean, the Council of Europe has already uh, published and passed uh, a recommendation on the safety of journalists, a recommendation uh, on media ownership transparency. It's currently working with uh, an experts committee on uh, uh, quality of journalism um, environments, uh, which will also um, be... Uh, um, moving towards the recommendations, I think, towards the end of next year. So the instruments are out there. I think it's up to member states to ratify them and take them to, to, to national law. On the trust indicators, um, well, to dispel your, your concerns, first of all, it's important to say that we are not looking at content because we believe that any instrument or mechanism that will judge, rate, or, or um, uh, have an opinion on content is per se a problem because it can be easily misused and turned into censorship. So what we are working on is purely on the procedural institutional level. Just to give you one example, identity. Um, more or less disclosure rules for media outlets, which we believe already contribute a lot to trust if media outlets are transparent about who they are. Um, a second uh, a drafting committee is working on criteria on um, journalistic methods complaint mechanisms and corrections, if they work or not. Again, this is a very technical, instrumental or institutional criteria, which has nothing to do with a piece of content itself, but the workings behind the enabling environment of journalism. So these are the criteria we are looking at. And as standard setting is the opposite of the law, it's a totally voluntary and self-regulatory, nobody is forced to take on such a standard. Take a last question here. Hi. Uh, I will try to take note on a little, some of some perspective that haven't been uh, debated for the for the table, and uh, in some of the perspective that we are trying to deal with, to think of a set of agendas to deal with the phenomena. The first is that. Uh, Information disorder, fake news, disinformation, we are talking about uh, a dispute on the field of speech. And uh, well, speech helps us to build the comprehension of the reality. Then this is a, the, the whole issue is a dispute on, on the very idea of truth. Uh, this is important because uh, what we, we saw in Brazil in the, the, some researches that we've done is that the idea of fake news is based on the idea of fake news is what the other says. The second is related to the field of psychology. Many researchers are bent over the question of the emptying of the soul. I know that sounds a bit esoteric, but the idea is that we're living in an era of emptiness. So people are desperate to believe in something to give meaning for their lives, and fake news plays an important role in this uh, process. And the third is, I heard a lot about uh, that the internet has reached, on a, uh, the speed that internet has reached on the information spree spreading, but not as much as the unprecedented scale that fake news industry has reached. This is an important issue also. And it comes to the set of agendas. Then I think the first is the field of regulation. Well, we have to think of carefully of, of the regulation and a type of regulation that doesn't undermine freedom of expression then this is a challenge here it's, it's very tricky and the second is the media democratization and, and I think that the, 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 the people you, you addressed it very well uh, but still we have to look into the field of a code of the code developing 
and uh, we have to find ways to, to, to deal in forests where the code is, is, is debated, that the producing of code is debated, like IETF and I3E, and these people are very, we have difficult for, to that, that bring these people to the discussion of political science, psychology, and sciences of culture. And the last one is, is, the, is the technology governance, and we have to open the black boxes of algorithms and personal data and bring this discussion to the public. Thank you. Thank you very much. In some ways, very appropriate place to end, uh, as this is only the first of many panels uh, at the Internet Governance Forum this year that deals with disinformation and related issues. I think there'll be many opportunities to dive deeper into some of the issues that you raise now. I think we can summarize very quickly here and say it's clear that governments around the world are looking for different approaches in this space. Everyone recognizes this is complex. Everyone recognizes this requires multi-stakeholder uh, responses. Everyone recognizes this requires a variety of different forms of expertise and independent evidence, ideally not evidence provided by self-interested actors with an ax to grind, uh, irrespective of where they come from. Um, and we can also see, if you will, a set of emerging responses uh, that range from uh, an American context where I can think we can say that a combination of a emphasis on the First Amendment combined with a uh, skepticism towards direct government response has left the field of responses largely to private companies, civil society, researchers and nonprofits and the like to respond rather than the government effectively responding. There is even a question about whether the government is willing to investigate alleged crimes um, undermining the integrity of elections and the like. Um, to a situation in, for example, mainland China, where clearly the government has been uh, very strongly in favor of a very muscular uh, interventionist response with a definition of what the government considers to be examples of rumors and misleading information, and is not shy about imposing obligations on private companies and others to police these things uh, in great detail. And I think we can see governments around the world looking for responses somewhere in between those two, if you will, ends of a spectrum. I think we've had powerful examples uh, of what such responses might look like, uh, ranging from Reporters Without Borders uh, and the work that you guys are doing around security and safety of journalists, but also increasingly around trust, EPU about empowering individual journalists, working with your member organizations to uh, play a positive role in this respect, and then of course the work that Tanya outlined uh, at the beginning of just reminding us of the importance of not letting any of these incremental individual responses stand on their own, but the importance of really trying to ensure that we marshal these responses uh, for a, a joint effort to protect fundamental rights and ensure that citizens have the kind of quality information environment that they um, deserve. So I look forward to being part of these, many of these conversations at the rest of the Internet Governance Forum, and I want you to please join me in thanking our panelists today for this first discussion. Because I am part of the broadcasting world and the broadcasting leaves of advertising, uh, I want to inform you that the, sec the session in this same room that will follow is about um, media uh, contents and how to incentivate the production of local contents. It's another session of EBU and WIPO together. Thank you. <laughs>